Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to my second video. We're going to use the Gauss Green formula to do some flow along and flow across calculations using double integrals. Now one quick caveat before we start using double integrals to compute flow along and flow across, the Gauss Green formula does require that the interior of our curve R um, does not contain any singularities. And the reason for that is as follows. Imagine you have a few singularities inside your curve C, so on the interior region R. Well, your double integral is going to accumulate over that interior, and we're going to end up with a double integral that is hitting places where the vector field is undefined, meaning that we can't trust any results we might be able to get out of our double integral, which only leaves us with a path integral as our method of computation. Now, the good news for this particular video is that we're going to deal with some examples that don't have any singularities. And then we'll save singularities for a later video when we're ready to start talking about that subtlety. All right, so my first piece of advice is when you're doing a flow along or flow across calculation using, um, using the gauss green formula, you wanna read the question very carefully. Look at the phrasing here. So we've got some vector field, we've got some closed curve, and then the question says, is the net flow of the vector field across the curve from inside to outside or outside to inside? So we're not actually being asked to measure the flow across. We just need to know if this result would produce a positive or a negative number. Is this integral gonna produce a number greater than zero or less than zero? And that's good news for us because when you look at this particular curve, it's not a great one to work with, right? It's, it's not just a standard parameterization for a circle or an ellipse. This little teardrop shape might not be very fun to integrate over, whether it's a double integral or a path integral. Either way, it's probably not something you want to do by hand if you can avoid it. But that's not what this problem is asking you to do. It says, is the net flow across from inside to outside or outside to inside? And when you compute the divergence of this vector field, it very quickly becomes apparent that there's something interesting going on here. If you look at this 7x plus 2, that's our m. So our dm dx is the derivative of 7x plus 2 with respect to x, that's 7. And then this dn dy, that's the derivative of y minus 6 with respect to y, that's 1. And then, of course, 7 plus 1 is equal to 8. So this divergence is constant everywhere, um, no matter what point in space we're at. Every single point in space is a source. And so watch how we can use the gauss green formula to produce a result for us without actually having to perform any integration. So um, the traditional way of doing this problem would be as a path integral. We don't want to do a path integral. Now, we don't have any singularities. There are no singularities in this vector field anywhere, but especially in the boundary. So we're in good shape there. So we can, uh, we can employ the gauss green formula to turn our path integral into a double integral of the divergence over the interior region. Um, now, this divergence is constant. It's always equal to 8. And so what ends up happening here is this integral, we could take the 8 out. So we have 8 times the double integral of 1 dx dy over our region R. Now this is the area of our region. That's always positive. 8 is always positive. And so we know that overall, this entire result is going to produce a positive number. Now, did I figure out what that positive number is? No way. Um, but that's not what the problem asks us to do. Um, so now we just have to write a little bit of a justification and we're good to go. So I'm gonna write, since the divergence is always positive for all X and Y, and there are no singularities in our region, this integral is positive for any closed curve. Look, this is a pretty strong result. It doesn't matter if it's this teardrop shape or a circle or any other curve that you can imagine. For any closed curve in this, uh, in this problem, the net flow of the vector field across that closed curve is going to be from inside to outside. 
for any closed curve, the net flow of the vector field across that curve is from inside to outside. Now, my one piece of advice would be uh, if you're producing arguments like this on your triad problems or on your lit sheet or something, um, there are two main things that you need to make sure that you have. First of all, you need all of this Gauss green logic from start to finish. And then you need a nice explanation, typically two sentences or so, to justify and explain what you did with the Gauss green formula. So you need the Gauss green formula in its entirety. That would be a path integral equals a double integral which then equals, and you could follow your logic from there. Um, what we're seeing in this problem is when the divergence is greater than zero, we have a source. And if we're accumulating all of our sources, that's guaranteed to give us a net flow of the vector field across the curve that goes from inside to outside, if we're only accumulating sources. Um, Great method because it doesn't have any computation. We'll also see the flip side where we actually do have to crunch some numbers. That'll be particularly the case when we have a vector field where we have some sinks and some sources. And if we have a vector field or if we have a curve that's enc encapsulating some sinks and some sources, then we don't really have much of a choice. We're gonna have to crunch the numbers and to see how that balance falls out. But in general, just keep in mind that we can define sources as places where the divergence is positive. We can define sinks as places where the divergence is negative. And of course, there are points that are neither sinks nor sources where the divergence is equal to zero. And then when you end up in the situation where the divergence is positive for all points inside a closed curve, we could do the same thing that we just did, which is all of our points are sources. So the net flow of the vector field across that curve is from inside to outside. And similarly, if all the points inside our curve have a divergence that's negative, all of our points are sinks, and then we have outside to inside, and the same thing can happen with zero. And there is a vocabulary word that goes with places where the divergence is equal to zero, um, incompressible. And if you have every single point in your vector field with a divergence equal to zero, that vector field is called an incompressible vector field. We could do the same thing with rotation. So when we have a place where the rotation of the vector field is positive, um, then that point adds a counterclockwise swirl. Um, I don't have a nice word like sink or source, but it adds a counterclockwise swirl. And when then that happens for all the points inside your curve, then the net flow of the vector field along your curve is counterclockwise. Um, if the rotation of the vector field is negative for all your points in your curve, then all of those points are adding a clockwise swirl and the net flow of the vector field along that curve is clockwise. And of course, the rotation of the vector field can also equal zero. And uh, when that happens for all the points in your vector field, you would call it either a conservative vector field or an irrotational vector field, depending on the context you're working in. Um, when you're thinking conservation of energy or something in a physics class, you would probably say conservative. Um, if you're working with a fluid dynamics sort of class, you might say irrotational. All right, so let's try another quick problem where we avoid computation altogether. Um, in this case, we're gonna be doing flow along, very similar to what we just saw. So I'm not gonna spend as much time on this one, but we compute the rotation of our vector field. Um, that is, we're gonna compute dn dx minus dm dy. So right here, we have our n, and if we take its partial derivative with respect to x, we get negative 6x squared. And then if we do the same thing for m, we're going to compute m uh, dm dy, which is going to give us negative 5y to the fourth. And look at this overall expression. We have negative 6x squared minus 5y to the fourth. This is always negative. Every single point in our vector field is going to contribute clockwise swirl. It's kind of like a sink for rotation. It's, it's providing clockwise swirl. Now, again, we do need to invoke the Gauss green formula. Um, you're going to have to get used to this. Um, you might feel kind of repetitive on your homework problems, but you are going to write out the Gauss green formula in its entirety 
and then provide your logic. So we start with a path integral that then turns into a double integral, and then we draw some sort of conclusion based on the details in the problem. And then we write a sentence or two explaining. So since the rotation of the vector field is always negative for all points, there are no and there are no singularities, um, our integral is going to be producing a negative result for any closed curve. So for any closed curve, the net flow of the vector field along that curve is clockwise. Um, you don't need to write a five sentence paragraph, but on the opposite end of the spectrum, I do not recommend putting these two sentences together into a big run on sentence. Um, I found that probably two to three sentences is about the right amount of writing for a problem like this. All right, and now let's try a problem where we actually have to crunch some numbers. And the giveaway that we have to do some number crunching here is that we see the word measure. We actually need to measure um, the net flow of the vector field across that curve. We want a numerical result, not just an inside to outside or outside to inside result. And it's a good thing that we are asked to do that because we could see that the divergence of our vector field, 2x minus 4y, has the property that in some places we have sinks and in some places we have sources. Um, you could certainly do something where you set this divergence equal to zero and go ahead and solve for y and then get an equation like y is equal to one half x and then go ahead and plot that, you know, something like this. And then we could say that above this line and below this line, we have, you know, sources versus sinks. And we could figure out where our sinks and sources are. Now, in this case, that's probably not a great use of your time because this double integral will do the accumulation for you. We just know that, the, that some of the points in our rectangle are going to be sinks, some of our points are going to be sources, and by running this double integral, we'll find out uh, the, the balance between the two. So, as usual, we write out the Gus Green formula. Our path integral that we don't want to compute turns into a double integral that we're pretty happy to compute. Um, some clues that this double integral is better than the path integral. Look at how we have one, two, three, four line segments. It's a rectangle. We have four line segments that uh, comprise our curve C. And so if we wanted to do this problem as a path integral, um, I'm going to kind of misuse notation here, but we would have to do one, two, three, four path integrals to get our result using, using uh, you know, the material that we knew in the previous chapter. That's not a great idea since now we know the Gauss Green formula and we could just do this as a single double integral. So uh, the integrals I wrote here are not really correct because I skipped all of the, you know, the integrand and the differential, but you get the idea of uh, what I'm trying to demonstrate right there. So now let's see how this double integral looks. Ah, yes, we're integrating over a rectangular region, which means that our limits of integration look pretty nice. They're just numerical. Um, and then I'll actually leave it to you to crunch the numbers. You get negative 105 from that. And so we can conclude that the net flow of the vector field across our closed curve is from outside to inside. And we're done. Um, you should look at the beginning of each of these problems if you have singularities. I forgot to point that out at the beginning. But you can see this vector field has no singularities, so we are not going to run into any problems by using a double integral. All right, so if we were in class together, I would have you guys try this one on your own just to get a little bit of practice. If you want to pause the video and try the, try the problem on your own and then compare with my solution, um, you're more than welcome to do that. Or if you kind of get the idea and you just want me to breeze through this, um, the rotation of this vector field comes out to 1 plus 2x. Some of our points are sinks, some of our points are sources. And so we are going to accumulate the net effect of those sinks and sources to measure the net flow of the vector field along our curve. Um, notice that this time we're using the rotation of the vector field dn dx minus dm dy. You can uh, verify this computation yourself if you'd like. Now I'm writing out the Gauss Green formula yet again. It, it's going to feel very repetitive, but it's very good practice because you'll never forget the formula if you keep writing it like this or copy pasting it in Casile. 
Now we're going to plug in our setup. And again, we're integrating over a rectangular region, so it's a pretty clean setup. And I will leave it to you to do the actual number crunching, but you get 140. Um, you're never done with these problems until you actually interpret that result, though. So we're now going to say that because we have a positive number, the net flow of the vector field along our closed curve is counterclockwise. Complete sentence there. So finally, guys, I'd like to wrap up this video by talking a little bit about gradient fields. Now, let's say you have a vector field that happens to be a gradient field with no singularities then you guys already know from a previous chapter that the net flow of that gradient field along any simple closed curve is equal to zero. The integral of field dot tangent is equal to zero. And you had some pretty good uh, intuition for why that was true when you think about surfaces and your change in altitude on your surface. Uh, you also were able to prove it using the 2D chain rule, um, which is a good proof to, to know. But what I want to do here is instead of rehashing a proof that you've already seen, why don't we put the Gauss Green formula to work? So what we previously saw uh, from this chapter is that if our vector field is a gradient field, that implies that the rotation of our vector field is equal to zero. And then we can just plug that into the Gauss-Green formula and make the Gauss-Green formula do the rest of the work. So our path integral is equal to the double integral of the rotation. We know that the rotation of our vector field is equal to zero, and we know that the double integral of zero is always equal to zero thereby showing that the net flow of a gradient field along a simple closed curve is guaranteed to equal zero. Anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in to this video. And in my next video, I'm going to talk about how to deal with singularities.